check one two three four one two three four light tech Good morning. Uh, I am obviously not uh, Francisco Moya. We expect him a little bit later. My name is Barry Grudenchik, um, member of this committee, and I will be failing, filling in for uh, uh, Chair Moya this morning. At this time, we are joined by uh, two of my colleagues. Queens is definitely in the House, Councilman Donovan Richards and Councilman Rory Lansman, and I see Councilman Salamanca about to make his way in, the chair of the uh, Land Use Committee. Uh, today we will start with a hearing on Land Use 70, the proposed revocable consent for Cafe Taboo to operate an unenclosed sidewalk cafe at 227 Dykeman Street in Manhattan in Council Member uh, Idanis Rodriguez's district. I am now going to open the hearing on Land Use 70, but I don't think we have any, do we have any speakers on? No, I don't think anyone would like to speak right now. Anybody here to testify on, on this uh, cafe? All right, uh, in that case we're going to... Okay, I've done this before. Uh, seeing none, we're going to close the hearing on Land Use 70. This is kind of like getting married. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Thank you. Um, our next hearing is on Land Use Numbers 86, 87, and 88, the Willow Avenue rezoning for property in Council Member Rafael Salamanca's district in the Bronx. The applicant, Markland 745 LLC, seeks approval of a zoning map change to per permit residential use and a zoning text amendment to designate the area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area subject to MIH option number one. These actions will permit the redevelopment of the applicant's site into an eight-story mixed-use building with 126 residential units, all of which will be affordable. In addition, HPD seeks a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law to achieve this 100% affordability. I will now open up the hearing on land use numbers 86, 87, and 88. And with us now is Councilman Salamanca. Would you like to make remarks, Mr. Chairman? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will uh, make my remarks after the, uh, their presentation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are joined this morning. By, um, we have a number of people on this panel. I see Adam Rothkrug and Lacey Tauber from HPD. Okay. If you could, the other members of the panel, could, if you could all state your names and then you'll be sworn in by the council. Good morning, Adam Rothkrug. William Bollinger. 
Brian Newman. Lacey Tauber. Counsel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Yes. yes. Please begin. Uh, good morning, uh, Councilman Gordenchik and members of the council. I'm Adam Rothkrug. I'm here on behalf of Markland 745 and JCAL Development, connection with our applications for a proposed rezoning and text change for a mandatory inclusionary housing area designation of their property on Willow Avenue between East 133rd Street and East 134th Street in the Port Morris section of the Bronx. The applications include a rezoning of the development site from M12 to M14 R7D MX, which would facilitate development of a mixed-use building, in this case a proposed eight-story building with commercial use on the first floor and 126 apartments on the upper floors with off-street parking for 29 cars in the cellar. The applications include a, the mapping of a mandatory inclusionary housing area and selection of option one requiring that a minimum of 25% of the building comply with the affordable housing regulations. And aside from that, the developers, as you'll hear testimony to, have been actively working with Councilman Salamanca with regard to the numbers and income bans applicable to this uh, building. As indicated on the tax map, the site outlined in red currently consists of four lots a total of 20,646 square feet, approximately 200 foot frontage on Willow Avenue and 100 foot in depth, running from East 133rd Street to East 134th Street. Two existing buildings on the lot, a three-story commercial building and a small one-story warehouse will be demolished. No existing residential or manufacturing occupancies will be displaced or otherwise affected by the proposed actions. There's one other building that will be included in the rezoning, a one-story manufacturing building, approximately 18,000 square feet in area, uh, occupied by the Empire Safe Company. Uh, this property is currently located in M12 district and will be rezoned to M12 R6A MX. It will also be included in the MIH district so that any future residential development would include mandatory uh, affordable housing. The development site and the Empire Safe site were the only properties excluded from the March 2005 extension of the original 1997 Port Morris Bruckner Boulevard rezoning, which expanded the MX district in this neighborhood and included the rest of this block except for these properties. In approving the 2005 extension, the Commission found that the existing infrastructure had capacity to support residential growth and that the area is well connected to Manhattan and the region. Subsequent to 2005, the Randalls Island Connector was approved and constructed, making the subject area even more desirable and appropriate for the introduction of additional residential and mixed-use development in the area. As indicated in the land use map, more than half of this block is already developed with residential uses, including a new residential building under construction on the north side of East 133rd Street. The introduction of new affordable residential use at this location is appropriate on this particular block. The development site and the remainder of the block was not included in the Port Morris Industrial Business Zone mapped in 2013. The proposed R7DM14 district uh, permits a maximum floor area ratio of 5.6, resulting in total permitted floor area of uh, 115,600 square feet. In this case, the plans indicate 15,000 square feet of commercial area on the first floor and approximately 100,000 square feet of residential floor area, including 126 dwelling units and a 3,000 square foot tenant recreation area with parking for 29 cars provided in the cellar. The plans include plans for a green roof with both solar panels, vegetation, and an outdoor tenant recreation area. Obviously, we are pleased to have obtained the approval of Community Board Number 1 and Borough President Ruben Diaz, who noted that this development could be transformative with respect to design and occupancy. I'd now like to introduce Brian Newman from Newman Design to give an overview of the proposed development, and we have other representatives of the development team uh, that have signed up to speak to provide further overview of the proposed development, uh, including the uh, uh, affordable housing that's proposed. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the rendering you see here depicts the front elevation on Willow, the right side of the, of the rendering is 134th, the left would be 133rd. <coughs> As you can see here, we have an eight-story building, uh, 85 feet, which is the max base height. Maximum allowed under the R70 is actually 100 feet. Um, as you can see, we stepped the building back on 134th as well as 133rd uh, to better relate to the 
residential buildings uh, be behind this property. The front elevation or the architectural style of this building uh, is uh, one of, I'll say, an industrial inter a modern interpretation of industrial warehouse, which directly relates to the warehouse uh, across the street from this parcel. Uh, that building happens to be 88 feet, so the height of our building is in context with, with the, uh, the surroundings directly across the street. Um, what you can see here, top left corner, sort of the gray is a site plan. Um, the, the dark gray is the main eight story. The two lighter gray um, square uh, areas are flanking the sides. That's where it steps down to sixth. And right in the middle, the very light gray, um, that's the roof of the one, uh, first floor. Oh, that's perfect. Could you just go back one? Yeah. Just go back one. <laughs> you did that on purpose? <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, what, just one back. Um, perfect. Uh, just a quick overview of the plans. The uh, orange color, that, was, that would be your first floor. That's the commercial aspect. As you can see, the commercial wraps all three street frontages. Um, uh, it's approximately 15,000 square feet. We have the residential lobby, which is the blue, blue section on 134th. The idea with having the commercial wrapping all three street frontages is to allow for pedestrian access and uh, activity at all times. Um, as I get further along in the renderings, you'll see we have, we have it well lit, and it will have uh, activity at all times. As you can see here, um, the retail's wrapping all corners. That's the right side is the residential entrance with the canopy. We have facade lighting that wraps all three um, street frontages, which add for pedestrian safety and access uh, to the uh, retail. It allows flexibility. Um, as far as uh, you can do this. Uh, that's the residential entrance here, a close-up. We can see that's 134th. As far as uh, <coughs> design techniques, we're utilizing uh, New York Active Design. When we first come into the lobby, the stair is one of the first things you'll see in there. In addition to being in front of the elevator, we've incorporated uh, local artists to, uh, to uh, incorporate uh, artwork inside the stairwells so they're not the, the dark gray, dingy stairwells that uh, unfortunately occur so often. Uh, as far as the amenities inside this building, there's package rooms. There uh, is also a large uh, recreation room on the second floor, approximately 3,500 square feet, which walks directly out to that roof uh, on that second floor uh, for the residents' use. Uh, in, in addition to that, we have on those terraces on the sixth floor, those are uh, terraces right off the elevator lobby for the residents' use as well. And on the main roof, as uh, Mr. Rothkrug mentioned prior, we have a, a green roof for the, this is a, a, a close up view of that site plan or that roof plan where you can see the active green roof. The blue stripe or strip behind that is photovoltaics uh, that will help uh, power the LED light fixtures. In addition, other green techniques we'll have uh, will be low flow plumbing fixtures, um, high, high SRI roof, uh, electrical ve vehicle charging stations in, in the uh, parking garage. Um, all finished materials will have, have high recycled content and low VOC paints and adhesives. So this aerial view, you can see as I was talking before, had the two terraces on either side and that low roof in, the bet in between. I think that's fine. Um, just, just go back to where you just were. You can go, go ahead one more. One more. So this is... Um, the middle of, uh, of Willow Avenue, this is a recessed area that we've created to accommodate multiple entrances for the retail. As I said before, it wraps around, but this also gives us an opportunity to have a prominent entrance for a larger tenant if possible, or, and it also allows flexibility for uh, all three sides or all three possible tenants. Uh, you can also see here the second floor is actually the laundry room that I was mentioning prior. So instead of putting it in the cellar, we've located it on the second floor to benefit the tenants. They have glass. They can look out. Um, the opposite side of this is also that roof for the, uh, uh, for the access for the tenants and the community room. So it's, it's, uh, it's open to all the residents, and they can come back and forth as they please, and they're not in the basement. <coughs> This is the uh, rendering on 133rd, where, you, again, you can see the retail wrapping. You can see the stepping of the building from 8 down to 6. In this picture, you see the uh, warehouse building across the street, as I was mentioning, and the uh, on the bottom left of this facade, 
That is the vehicular access to the parking garage, which has 29 cars. So this is just an aerial view from 134th. Looking down is an overview. Similar from the opposite side. Um, turn it over to unit for unit district distribution. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian. <coughs> Um, you'll see on uh, on this slide that we have a um, a good distribution of units, of which we actually have a, a decent amount of uh, three bedroom units. Um, so we're we're gearing up for uh, larger family size units. Um, as far as affordability levels go, uh, you know we started off early in the process, um, looking to do an M square project, um, and working in consultation with the council member Salamaka, we've. Um, had a variety of iterations of those affordability levels, um, four to be exact, uh, to where you'll see on the right-hand column is what we've proposed now, um, and we've been working in coordination with HPD um, on those bands as well. Uh, as Brian had mentioned from uh, uh, accessibility factor, um, this is, uh, it, it's, it's ideally suited um, amongst the highway transportation. It's not far from the uh, number six train, um, and it has great, uh, and what we're trying to take advantage of, great access to um, bike lanes that have been created by the city, um, including the Randalls Island connector. Um, so from a sustainability perspective, we're near a lot of large employers, including the New York Post, um, uh, uh, Fresh Direct, um, and nothing is more sustainable than um, a location where you can either walk or bike to work. Um, this just kind of gives a context to some of the other things in the neighborhood. There's been a lot of new development in the neighborhood. Silver Cup Studios um, is what you see up to the north. Um, again, to the, to the lower left, you see where Fresh Direct and FedEx in, and the New York Post is in proximity. You see the Randalls Island connector, the large yellow um, strip, and the uh, um, excited about the 132nd Street Pier, which is going to be rebuilt at the end of 132nd Street, and hopefully the Gantry Park um, uh, just to the north of that. It's caddy corner from the Port Morris Distillery and, uh, and Tavern, and there's a lot of new uses coming um, up into the area. Uh, from a marketing strategy, we're very much committed to making sure that the project not just meets the HPD 50% uh, uh, goals as far as um, community board preference, um, but greatly exceeding that and and how we do that is um, I know the council members actually been coordinating with HPD on some strategy sessions to help uh, uh, local residents with issues such uh, that can impair them such as credit um, scores and things like that how to c correct that the other thing is just making sure that people um, are aware of it when it happens because through the HPD lottery process there's a very tight window that one has in order to, to apply so one of the things that we're going to be doing proactively is we're going to be placing a a sign on the site because people go past our developments all the time that will tell them where to send an email for information obviously it's a lottery process they have to go through it but if we let them know as soon as the uh, marketing ad hits um, then we'll have a better chance of having more people from the community board uh, uh, submit applications and hence a uh, greater opportunity to ensure that we're going to exceed the 50 percent community preference um, we're very much committed. Um, we've been a partner myself, um, and, and I should mention Josh Weissman and Barry Altmark are part of our uh, development team on the partner side. Um, we've all been in the Bronx since the early 90s. Um, in fact, the Altmarks have been in here since the 70s. We're committed to working with um, local MWB companies. Uh, we buy a lot from the local suppliers, CASA, um, uh, and a lot of our trades are within the local community, so it's very important to us to make sure that we reach out and we have as much local participation as possible. Um, retail tenant mix. Uh, one of the things that's very key in a lot of upcoming neighborhoods is the fear of, uh, of the, not just gentrification, but gentrification of the retail aspect. The big boxes coming in or, or, or corporate chains coming in and squeezing out mom and pops. So we're very sensitive to this. So um, in some other developments and areas, we work with local MWB type um, businesses. Um, in the case, uh, we have uh, Alexander Avenue. Uh, the young lady on the top there is uh, Noel Santos. She's opening up the first bookstore in the Bronx since the one up in Co-op City closed. Um, and down below um, are the two gentlemen who started the Bronx Draft House and have several other concepts, including the beat stroll that you'll see opening up in the Bronx very soon. So what we, what we care about is reaching out and making sure that 
we, we, we actually enhance and, and appeal to the, like to kind of the local atmosphere and maintaining the culture because that that's very important to these neighborhoods as they change uh, making sure that everyone from within has opportunity Oh, those are just extra slides. Um, so one of the things that we're also committed to, we, as as Brian had mentioned, we have um, we'll have ample amount of uh, cameras um, surrounding the building. Um, uh, we have uh, access um, uh, at certain location points. The parking underneath will have a lot of cameras um, as far as security features go, um, and uh, we, we're going to use a, a variety of systems that. Um, uh, uh, maintain like who has access to the building and who doesn't. So that's a very important um, aspect as far as um, the development goes. Uh, and then finally, with respect to the retail, uh, you know, we have heard a lot of desire for um, some type of, 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 of like commercial um, grocery store. So we're talking to tenants who we've had other developments that have done grocery stores. Um, so we're gonna be talking to them about the possibility of putting a small store within the uh, project. And that's kind of the project in a nutshell. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Salamanca. Actually, I have a testimony oh, about I'm the Article sorry. 11 application. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Don't be shy. Um, my name is Lacey Tauber. I'm with HPD um, Government Affairs. And so I'll be speaking specifically on their Article 11 application. Uh, land use number 88 consists of a proposed Article 11 tax benefit for exemption area known as 111 Willow Avenue which is privately owned land located on block 2562, lots 59, or sorry, 49, 56, 58, and 60 in Bronx Council District 17. The sponsor for the project currently has before the zoning subcommittee a zoning text amendment and establishment of a mandatory <coughs> inclusionary housing, MIH, area related to land use items 86 and 87. Summarizing the 111 Willow Avenue project, the sponsor will construct one nine-story mixed-use building with 120 sec 126 residential units under HPD's mix and match program for low income families and ground floor retail space, um, 15,125 square feet. It is anticipated that approximately 32 units will be permanently affordable under MIH option one. In addition, another 19 units are anticipated to be permanently affordable as HPD will provide subsidy for the MIH units. In total, approximately 51 units will be permanently affordable. The overall project area will be approximately 148,702 square feet. The proposed building will consist of 19 studio units, 66 one bedrooms, 22 two bedrooms, including one superintendent's unit, and 19 three bedrooms. Uh, in accordance with the mix and match program terms and also conversations with the council member, the overall proposed affordability mix is as follows. 15% of the units will be affordable to formerly homeless households earning up to 30% of AMI. 10% of the units will be affordable to households earning up to 30% of AMI. 10% of the units will be affordable to households earning up to 40% of AMI. 10% of the units will be affordable to households earning up to 50% of AMI. 5% of the units will be affordable to households earning up to 100% of AMI. And 32% of the units will be affordable to households earning up to 130% of AMI, plus the supers unit for a total of 126. Common areas such as a laundry room, bicycle storage, and a community room will be available to all residents. There will be 29 residential parking spaces available for rent. The project will also include 15,125 square feet of ground floor retail space. Overall, the total project will be approximately, sorry, there's a typo here. As mentioned, HPD is before the council seeking approval of an Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years that will coincide with the regulatory agreement in order to assist with facilitating long-term affordability. Uh, the projected cumulative tax benefit is approximately $25,824,875. And the net present value is $6,699,883. Councilman Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I uh, want to welcome you all uh, for uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I want to open up by really thanking this group on working with me on this project. Um, and just to point something out for this committee, 
uh, when the uh, Oatmark and J.Cow group originally came to see me, they, they proposed an M-square project where 75% of their project was 80% AMI to 120% AMI, and only 25% of their project was at a 40% AMI to 60% AMI with no homeless set aside. And my concern with this particular location was that this area is ripe for gentrification. I mean, it's, it's and you know, it's a Port Morris community, it's an industrial area, it's an up and coming community. Um, but I also understood that there was, there was a certain block in which, where this project falls under, uh, there's residential. And there was a rezoning that was done years ago and there was never understood why this part of that block was not rezoned. I mean, you made a brief explanation, but years later, you know, I, I know that you guys regret that. Um, so we went from, se from, from the 75% of 80 to 120 and 25% from 40 to 60 to now there's gonna be a 15% homeless set aside. 34% of the project is for uh, families making 30% AMI to 60% AMI. And we reduced the 80% AMI to 120% AMI from 75% of the entire project to 50% of the entire project. And we changed the M square to MIH option one. This is what's truly affordable for my community. Um, and it's just a message that I'm sending out to all developers. There's a lot of development happening in my community. I am, I, I am in favor of developing underdeveloped land but please come correct. Please come with projects that are truly affordable for my community. I would not accept anything less than that. With that said, um, I just have a question in terms of, I, I know that there's concerns in terms of uh, labor uh, working, specifically I know 32BJ will speak on that. Um, I just wanna hear on the record, what, what are the concerns? I'm hearing that this project's uh, does not allow financially, it's not financially feasible uh, to have um, maintenance workers uh, from, from labor, whether it's 32BJ or anywhere else. If you can just please explain that to me on the record. Um, sure, um, first of all, we are committed to um, providing a living wage and, and we will be trying to work with HPD um, in the next uh, you know, short period of time um, to, to try to you know, kind of figure out what that gap is. Basically what happens is um, when you add any kind of extra expense to a project that is not anticipated, um, it reduces the cash flow that's there to service the debt. And ultimately HPD through their house, sister housing agency, the Housing Development Corporation, provides long-term uh, tax exempt bond financing for the project. Um, and so far we have to be kind of mindful and sensitive to making sure that we're able to service the debt because well, we don't want to get ourselves and the project in trouble. Certainly the, the people doing the financing um, have concerns with their bondholders to make sure that the uh, project is, um, is, is, is viable project. So um, we've started these conversations and, and, and we would you know, like to expedite that as much as possible, um, but we have to work with them as well because we can't do this in a vacuum ourselves. But we're committed, we're committed to that. Uh, well, I'm also committed to that. You know, I am also committed to having a, a side conversation with you, uh, maybe changing, you know, certain, um, uh, I, I guess, AMI units without losing the affordability of this project to ensure that we can accommodate labor there. I mean, it's important to me, and I'm pretty sure it's important to this body that we get as many uh, good paying jobs within labor, which offers protection. Um, so we, we really advocate for that. So um, again, but I wanna thank you for really working with me and moving this project around um, uh, to fit the needs of my community. Uh, in terms of job creation, can you speak about some of the jobs that this uh, development will create um, for construction? Um, I think we, we figured around 80 um, jobs uh, off and on throughout the entire process. So you're talking about a 24 month to 30 um, month process. Um, roughly, eight, I mean, it'll be more than 80 jobs, but 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 typically 80 to 120 people. Um, Josh, what's the, about that on on site at, at the height of the? Uh, the period from March to 
I'm sorry. Can you just come to the mic, please? Yes. You want to come up? You're gonna. Josh really runs the construction That's side fine. of things, so I don't want to misspeak. Hi, Joshua uh, Weissman. Could, could, before you speak, I'm going to ask the council uh, to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be true? Yes. Thank you. So on a, uh, a job like this, typically you'll have between, let's say, 60 to 100 uh, men or women working at one time. Um, for instance, when you first start and you just have the foundation company there, there could be 20 guys. But once you have superstructure going up, plumbers, electricians, carpenters following the chain, you'll have many more. So I would say you're north of 200 jobs throughout the project, but we would b basically be at 60 to 90 at each, any specific time. How will, you, how will you ensure that there's local hiring in this uh, project? So um, we're, our, most of our business is in the Bronx. Um, our office is in the South Bronx. And our electricians, our plumbers, our roofing supply, our masonry supply, our electrical supply all comes from within the borough. It, it behooves us to have that also because it's easier for the men and women to get to work if they're coming from the Bronx and staying in the Bronx and dealing with two hours of traffic like I had to deal with this morning. And also it's good because supplies, if we're missing something, we could easily get it quickly if we're getting it from Casa, Melrose, Jenna. Um, we get from uh, Tremont Supply Electrical, S&J's Roofing, Palace Plumbing is our supply for on Southern Boulevard for plumbing. So it, it, it helps everyone on the project to stay local. Yeah. I want to also commend you. I, I, I've done my research, and I know that your, your company, when you do developments, there is you use local businesses, um, and you really keep your word. A lot of developers come and say, you know, we're going to use local businesses, but we don't hear from them again. But you guys do have a track record uh, on yeah. that. Um, my um, other question is for HPD. Um, you know, housing forums is something that I've, uh, I've implemented in my, in my district. I just want to get a commitment from HPD that you will work with this group, having a housing forum, ensuring that there's true community, there's a real community preference, and what that means, educating the community, having an event. I just want to get a commitment on the record that you will um, host something side by side with my office. Yeah, that is absolutely something that we're committed to do. Um, we can work with, uh, I don't know if you are working with any specific local groups, we can make connections to uh, you know, our housing ambassadors and folks who can help people uh, fill out the applications. We can also host workshops locally in the community to make sure that people get connected. Yeah, um, recently we've had a few housing forums with um, Manny Management, mm -hmm. not for profit. Yeah, we did two with the, to one of your community boards, yes, I believe. So yeah. You know, they it, it's worked. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we can keep it consistent. I mean, I'm open yeah. to anyone. Um, for the developer, uh, looking at the recommendations for a Bronx Community Board 1, they were very specific about who their property manager is. And I know I've said this on the record, and I'll say it again. Uh, Wavecrest is, is, a, is a major concern in our communities, and we recommend all new project developers not to use Wavecrest. Do we have a commitment that you will not be using Wavecrest for this project as well? Yes, we've already um, spoken with Sandra Erickson, who's a, uh, South, uh, a Bronx management company, an MWBE, called uh, Sandra Erickson Management. Yes, she is a local mm -hmm. um, business. Thank you. Um, with that said, um, thank you again uh, for all your work and working with me. And what I'm mostly excited about, and I just want to point out to my colleagues, another project that 15% homeless set aside, and I really hope that uh, my colleagues will uh, partner with me on potential projects in the district uh, for a homeless set aside at 15 percent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Salamanca. We have been joined at this hearing by uh, Council Member uh, Costa Costantanidis from Queens and Council Member Carlina Rivera from Manhattan. Um, at this point, I don't believe there are any more questions for this panel. Um, but we do have two more people willing to testify, wishing to testify. Um, I'm going to call up first Barry Altmark. Is he here? Yes, Mr. Altmark is one of the developers, okay. and he'll waive his uh, speaking on this. We love you, Mr. Altmark. Um, the person, the next person who wishes to testify uh, is Melissa Marshall. Um, 
if you could clear out that, and Ms. Marshall, if you could come forward. Ms. Marshall, if you could start. The Sergeant Arms is going to set the clock for two minutes uh, due to the large crowd that we have here today. Okay. But if you start now, you get extra time. <laughs> Great. Good morning, Chairperson. Go I don't want to mispronounce Just call me Barry. Okay, Barry. <laughs> Good morning. And the Zoning Committee. My name is Melissa Marshall. I work at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. Um, I'm here today on behalf of 32BJ, the union. My project will, um, excuse me. This project will create much needed affordable housing in the Bronx, a goal that our union supports. But without a commitment to provide good jobs at the development, workers would like, workers like me often making poverty wages. Affordable housing is about lifting working people up. But on behalf of housing, but affordable housing fails to achieve this mission unless it goes hand in hand with jobs that pay family, sus sus family sustaining wages and, ba and benefits. We think that Altmark and HPD have opportunity and responsibility to promote high road employment at this site. Development projects that rely on taxpayers' resources should never undercut a hard run labor standard. Workers have fought for. That's why we are arguing at City Council to ensure that Altmark commits the payment, I mean, excuse me, paying industry standard wages and benefits for workers and the Bronx. We also call the city to use the role to support good building services, jobs, and development. My union and I understand how important the new affordable housing is for, for this neighborhood. A good job commitment is important steps towards ensuring that this development truly benefits the Bronx. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony here this morning, and thank you for your work at the museum. It's very important thank you, for, for all New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Uh, Uh, there are, at this time, no other uh, people wishing to testify it on this issue. There are no I'm asked to ask if there's anybody else. All right. Am I going to get a B grade here? What is going to be my grade later? Uh, anybody else going once, twice? Seeing none, we're going to close this hearing. Uh, at this time, we've also been joined uh, by Councilman uh, Reynoso, who represents the great borough of uh, Brooklyn, as well as 20% of your district is in Queens, I know that. Um, so welcome to you this morning. Um, our next hearing. Okay, page six. Our next hearing is on the Hudson Boulevard and Park text amendment, land use number 85. The special Hudson Yards district and Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan was established in 2005 to transform Hudson Yards into a dynamic, transit-oriented urban center with a variety of mixed uses, including commercial, residential, open space, cultural, and entertainment. One of the major goals was to create a 20-acre open space network. The primary open space in this network is the Hudson Boulevard and Park, a linear north-south park running from West 33rd to West 39th Streets, mid-block between 10th and 11th Avenues. The Hudson Boulevard and Park has been planned in two phases. Phase one, which runs from 30 th West 33rd Street to West 36th Street, blocks one through three, was acquired and built out by the city and opened to the public in 2015. Phase two, which runs from West 36th to West 39th Streets, blocks four through six, still remains in private ownership. This tax amendment proposed by the Department of City Planning <laughs> would facilitate the private development of phase two of the Hudson Boulevard Park for use by the public. Uh, we are joined this morning by Annie White of the Department of City Planning and Dominic Ansinwi, Sanwinini, Answeeney, worse than Brudenchik. Uh, also from the Department of City Planning, I'm going to now ask the council to uh, swear you both in. Good morning. Please state your name. Annie White. Dominic Ann Sweeney. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. I do. 
Please begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, we are here to discuss city planning com department's application for a text amendment to modify sections of the special Hudson Yards district. This section regulates floor area transfers and the contribution in kind authorization for the phase two of the Hudson Boulevard and Park. So overall, the goal of this text amendment is to further facilitate the process through which private developers may build out portions or entire lots blocks of the Hudson Boulevard and Park so that the community and the city may see an expedited development of the public open space in Hudson Yards. For some background, the Special Hudson Yards District was adopted in 2005 with the intention of fostering a mixed use, medium to high density business district with an extensive open space network. The primary open space is the Hudson Boulevard and Park, which I've indicated here by the red outline. It's a linear north-south park bordered by a tree-lined boulevard that upon completion will run from West 33rd Street to West 39th Street between 10th and 11th Avenues. So the park was planned in two phases. Phase one of the park running from West 33rd to West 36th Street includes what we refer to as blocks one through three. And, it's, um, and these sites were acquired by the city for redevelopment and open to the public in 2015. Phase two, which is the subject of this text amendment and also um, indicated here by the red outline, runs from West 36th to West 39th Street and includes blocks four through six. This phase is not yet under construction and lots in phase two are still in private ownership. They are subject to special regulations in the special Hudson Yards District designed to facilitate their improvement as the boulevard and park while also allowing owners to recognize value from their, from their property by um, selling off development rights to um, sub-districts throughout the special district or getting a district improvement fund bonus in exchange for construction of the boulevard and park. This is a just aerial to put, um, put the boulevard and park into context. Uh, you can see that it runs north of what is now the currently being developed Eastern Rail Yards and it's uh, just directly east of the Javits Center. So section 9332 of the zoning resolution is the subject of this text amendment and it outlines certain floor area mechanisms for this phase two of the Boulevard and Park. So just to run through these, first there can be no new development or expansion of uh, buildings in the mapped Boulevard and Park. Owners of property can transfer development rights from the mapped park parcels to receiving sites throughout the special district. And three, owners may seek a contribution in kind authorization which allows property owners to build out portions or entire blocks of the boulevard and park in exchange for district improvement bonus development rights. So in July of last year, the City Planning Commission approved the first of these contribution in kind authorizations for Tishman Spire for a portion of the park on block four. So this is the current phase plan for that block four of the park, just to give you an idea of what this may look like. The previous contribution in kind I mentioned um, is shown in that uh, number one, the upper left portion, where they will be building out that L-shaped, fairly large portion of the park. Um, and this, I wanted to just show this phasing plan as an example of how we anticipate this park can be built out as individual um, lots are acquired and incorporated into the overall approved design. So the Department of City Planning is pleased that this mechanism is being used as we want to see the expedited development of the, of the park. However, city planning has been approached by multiple parties, including the Hudson Yards Development Corporation and private developers who claim there are certain limitations in the current text that discourage um, private applicants from seeking this authorization. Um, and the text was, uh, the proposed text is meant to address these specific concerns. Um, and I'll kind of run through those now. Uh, the, the, the most substantial change is the first one I'm gonna mention and the rest are fairly, um, they're, they're more cleanup actions. So the most significant concern is regarding the sequencing of the requirements for the contribution and kind authorization. So currently before seeking this authorization, applicants must first acquire the Boulevard and Park lots or lots, sell off the development rights and clear that, and clear indeed the site over <coughs> to the city. That process can delay the contribution in kind approvals as it's often difficult to, um, as you can imagine, it'd be difficult to secure funding to go out and actually acquire um, lots in the Boulevard and Park prior to having that authorization in hand. 
So the proposed text would allow owners to seek the authorization prior to fulfilling those previously stated conditions, as long as those conditions were accomplished as of the date of the authorization or in accordance with agreements or instruments entered into by the city. And there's some checks that are built into that to ensure that we do um, to, you know, other beyond the, the legal documents that require them to build out the bl portion of the Blue Board and Park. Um, the proposed text also requires that the entity responsible for the contribution in kind, so the entity that's building out the park, uh, actually has site control prior to receiving um, a building permit for that bonus floor area. So moving on, um, currently the contribution kind requires a construction schedule at the time of authorization, but the text is unclear as to how detailed that schedule must be. Um, and the text just clearly cl clarifies that we do not need a full construction schedule, but an outline of the schedule including major milestones <coughs> such as 50% complete and then substantially complete. Number three, um, currently only owners of the granting and receiving site can apply for this authorization. But as we know from the, the previously stated issue, um, now applicants um, may be seeking the authorization prior to having site control. So the proposed text would allow both owners and contract vendees to apply for transfers of floor area. The fourth change is that the current zoning doesn't explicitly outline how that contribution in kind bonus would be calculated. Um, the text just clarifies that this bonus would be the reasonable cost of the contribution kind or the cost of the um, construction of the park divided by the price of the district improvement fund bonus at the time of the authorization. So this is the exact same calculation that was done for that previously granted authorization that everyone agreed to. Um, it's just formalizing this in the zoning. And then finally, um, the current text is somewhat unclear regarding the type of legal documents that are required and the text just outlines that the a transfer agreement and a notice of restrictions is required for the transfer of floor area and a restrictive declaration is required for the contribution in kind authorization. Um, so this in the, um, throughout the public review, um, it was unanimously approved by community board four and um, the borough president chose to not write a recommendation for this item. And I would just wanna stress that this text amendment does not substantially change the process through which developers may seek the, um, may improve the boulevard and park or the process through which the boulevard and park may be developed but intends to further facilitate that process so that private developers may take advantage of the contribution in kind mechanism that's already set in the zoning so that um, the entire city may see um, the development of public open space in Hudson Yards. Thank you. No. Just here for questions. Here for questions. <laughs> And you may not be able to answer this, but um, when does city planning anticipate the completion of phase two? So the city <coughs> and Hudson Yards Development Corporation are um, wanting to continue conversations about the completion of the park with city council. Okay. And um, are there any efforts being made to build out blocks five and six, or is that just a little too early as well? Th there are definitely, there's definitely interest. Um, you know, there have been previous discussions with owners. Um, block five is a bit more complicated as there's a lot, there's <laughs> many owners still in that area of the park. Um, but we're hoping that by, you know, this text amendment would not just be applied for block four where we know there is immediate interest but could potentially be utilized by owners in the future. And when we're done someday, <laughs> Will this be a city, I have to ask this question because I'm chair of parks, will this be a city park or will it be a privately owned but accessible to the public park? It's, it, a it's mapped as a park right now. So, so we'll be, it will be, who will own it at the end of the day? Um, what do you think? Which entity? I won't, I, I know you're sworn this, but I won't hold you to it. I think parks. But you I think, think parks. parks, okay. All right, um, no, so it will be mapped as parkland, that's good to know. Um, any other questions, Mr. Costantinides? No? Okay. Um, you want me to say anything? Yes, I'll All right, you guys can leave. You're dismissed. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Are there any members of the public here to testify in this application? Uh, seeing none, we will close this hearing. And we'll get on to our next hearing.
uh, which is on land use 84, which is the 45 Broad Street Subway Improvement Bonus Special Permit Application. The applicant, Madison 45 Broad Development LLC, is proposing to make improvements to two subway stations, including the installation of two elevators in order to receive a floor area bonus of up to 3.0 uh, floor area ratio, which is 71,391 square feet. This floor area would be used, excuse me, in a proposed 80-story mixed-use building on property located at 45 Broad Street within the special Lower Manhattan District Ten. in Council Member Margaret Chin's district. If you're ready, I am going to open up a uh, hearing on land use 84. I think we will hear from Councilwoman Chin uh, in a bit. So uh, on this panel, we have Matthew Klein. Oh, I'm sorry. These three, okay. So we have, um, why don't you identify okay. yourself? Okay. Uh, David Karnowski, Freed Frank, Land Use Council uh, to the applicant. Good morning. Nat Baranko, Urban Architects. Uh, Eugene Slaughter, Secretary of Architecture, Chris Baranko. And members of the development team have signed up and are available to answer okay. questions. All right, I'm going to ask the council to swear you in. We've been joined now by. Um, Councilwoman Chin, and I'm going to ask her before we start with you if she has an opening statement to make or if she'd like to follow up. Uh, no, I, I have a statement. Okay. <coughs> so we will now hear from uh, Councilwoman Chin. <coughs> Thank you, Councilwoman. Good morning. Uh, my name is Council Member Margaret Chin, and I represent Council District 1 in Lower Manhattan, where this application for a special permit is located. And thank you uh, to Chair Moyer, but like, you, you're sitting in, Barry? I'm pinch hitting. All right, well, thank you to the substitute chair. I don't dress as well, but I'm better looking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is on record, Barry. So yes, ma'am. Go right. ahead. <laughs> And thank you to my colleague on the subcommittee for this opportunity to speak about this important application. And thanks to the workers and community members for attending this hearing. The transit improvements included in this application, which includes elevators to the JZ Broad Street Station, are incredibly important for riders with disability who are often denied access to our subway system. If approved, these elevators would make the station one of the only six accessible stations along a 13.5 mile subway line stretching from Lower Manhattan to Jamaica, Queens. The fact that these vital improvements for the tens of thousands of differently able New Yorkers are being proposed as a result of a land use application is a disgrace that should be discussed more fully at another place in time. At this hearing, with the applicant, my colleagues on the subcommittee and the members of the community present, I would like to reaffirm my priority for this project, which I believe are shared by the vast majority of people in the community that I represent. I believe that the residents of every community in our city deserve the right to quiet enjoyment of their homes, Today, residents in my council district from Lower Manhattan to Tribeca to NoHo have had to endure sleepless nights with windows shut against the racket, the dust, and the disturbance of after hours and weekend work. As part of this process, and hopefully for long after, I trust that the applicant will continue to participate in these important conversation for our community and our city. And I think that uh, there are other people here who might be talking about uh, this project. And as in uh, District 1 in Lower Manhattan, we want to make sure that we also have good paying jobs. Uh, so I think that's something that I know that the, uh, the project is, uh, is very open to and I'm happy that uh, has happened. But I just want to make sure that going forward the project will be a good neighbor because you're surrounded by residents. So hopefully through the, the process, uh, you'll keep to the promise that you made. So thank you, Chair, for this opportunity to speak. 
thank you council member chin thank you for being with us this morning on this very important issue in your district i'm now going to ask the council to swear you in so please raise your right hand and please also state your names Nat Veronico. david karnowski eugene Flattery. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Yes. I do. I do. Uh, good morning, members of the committee and Council Member Chin. Again, I'm David Karnofsky uh, from Fried Frank Land Use Council to the applicant, Madison 45 Broad Development, LLC. This is an application for a special permit to provide a floor area bonus for a proposed new mixed-use building at 45 Broad Street. Uh, in connection with the provision of improvements to the Broad Street Station of the Nassau Jay-Z subway line and the Wall Street Station of the Lexington 405 line, which is connected to uh, the Broad Street Station by an underground passage. I'm going to provide a very basic overview of the project. I'll be followed by Nat Baranko of Urban Architects, who will describe the subway improvements in more detail, and then by Eugene Flatteron of Citra, Citra Ruddy, the architects for the building. The development site is a vacant lot on the east side of Broad Street between Exchange Place and Beaver Street. It is uh, approximately 12,000 square feet of lot area. Uh, it's on a zoning lot uh, shown here that also includes an adjacent parcel to the north uh, occupied by an 11-story, approximately 93,000 square foot uh, private school. The site uh, is within the Special Lower Manhattan District, Zone C55. This is a district that permits a basics, base maximum FAR of 15 for commercial or community facility uses, of which 12 FAR may be for residential use if recreation space is provided. At 15 FAR, a total of approximately 356,000 square feet can be provided on the zoning lot. Since the school building uh, exists and is to remain, an as of right building on the development site uh, could have approximately 263,000 square feet. The zoning lot, as you can see from uh, this slide, is adjacent to the Broad Street Station, and as such, the applicant is eligible to apply for and receive a subway improvement bonus of up to three FAR for improvements to the Broad Street and the Wall Street stations. Three FAR over the zoning lot is equivalent to 71,391 <coughs> square feet. In 2015, the applicant approached the New York City Transit Authority to identify bonus eligible improvements for the station and the authority identified a important need for elevators to provide ADA compliant access as well as a need to improve egress and ingress at two control areas at the Wall Street Station. Nat Baranka will describe these in more detail. But I wanted to make a couple of points about the importance of the elevators to the station and to the system. By one estimate, only 23% of New York City subway stations are ADA accessible. This compares unfavorably to San Francisco, Atlanta, LA, and Miami, where 100% of stations are accessible. Boston, where 94% are accessible. Chicago, where 65% are accessible. And the District of Columbia, where 50% of stations are accessible. A recent article in the Wall Street Journal noted, quote, that a major hurdle to installing elevators from streets to subway systems is that construction is costly. And this is especially tricky, the Wall Street Journal said, in New York City. As you're well aware, the authority and the MTA have capital constraints, and there's no funding available for elevators at this station. Uh, it's fair to say that the elevators will not otherwise be built for many years, absent the floor area bonus. The application proposes two elevators, one at the northbound platform and one at the terminus southbound plan platform, materially increasing accessibility for the disabled in lower Manhattan. Um, the special permit would increase the floor area permitted on the zoning lot up to a maximum of 18 FAR, uh, allowing the proposed building to contain 274,000 square feet of residential floor area above a commercial base of approximately 60,000 square feet. Uh, if the floor area bonus is improved, the building height and the building envelope will not increase beyond what has already been approved by the Department of Buildings for an as of right building at 15 FAR, now under construction. Instead, the applicant will reduce floor to ceiling heights within the envelope of the approved uh, as of right building. Um, the zoning resolution states that in determining the amount of a bonus, the city shall consider the degree to which general accessibility and security of the subway station is improved by the provision of new connections, et cetera, including provision of escalators or elevators. Uh, we believe that the addition of these two elevators is a major improvement to the system, as the council member noted. Um, and that the full bonus is warranted <coughs> under these circumstances. 
I'm going to now turn it over to Nat Baranko, who will describe the improvements in more detail. Thank you, David. The uh, Broad Street Station is located under Broad Street, as its name uh, implies. Um, its northern terminus, term the northern end of that station is at Wall Street, and its southern end is mid-block between Exchange Place and Beaver Street, and touches upon the property um, under discussion. It also connects to the Wall Street northbound platform uh, through a passageway from the upper mezzanine at Wall Street. The station is the terminal station for the J and Z line, um, and uh, that line, as Councilman said, has currently five uh, accessible locations, only one of which is in Manhattan, and that location is about eight blocks and uh, uh, 1,800 feet north of this location. And the terrain between that station and this location is n was not created <coughs> for ADA accessibility. It's very difficult if you're in a wheelchair or if you if you can't walk very well. So the br providing accessibility to the station will be a major benefit to the accessible community and um, the community uh, in which it's located. Plans you see above the uh, I for geographic reference, north is to the right. Um, so the plan accepted by New York City Transit involves two elevators at the intersection of Exchange Place and Broad Street. The elevator on the northeast side of Exchange Place provides access to the northbound control area, which is the, which is the um, entry platform for that line. And the elevator on the um, southwest corner of Exchange Place and Broad provides access to the southbound platform, which is a discharge platform. The elevators do sit fall at the street level within the historic map district. Uh, as such, we've, uh, we, we, apply, we um, went to LPC. They've approved the location. There will be some curb realignment, which we've discussed with DOT. DOT has accepted the realignment. Their main concern, because this, although this is a pedestrian um, uh, zone, um, their main concern was fire department access in emergencies, which we've provided in the reconfiguration of the street. And all the materials that we're using within the historic area is going to be consistent with what's currently present. At the platform level, the south, the um, pla elevator which accesses the northbound platform, which is the departure platform, will be, um, you will discharge yourself at the platform level into an expanded unmanned control area. On the northbound platform, you will be, we will be reconfiguring the, um, I'm sorry, at the southbound platform, we will be reconfiguring the control area to accommodate the elevator. Passengers who enter from the street will come down the elevator to the uncontrolled, unmanned control area and enter the platform through a fare array. And at the um, discharge platform southbound, you will come through the control area, come into the elevator, and go up to the street. As part of this project, there are um, improvements to f two control areas on the southbound uh, platform of Wall Street. Um, currently, those two locations have what's called high entrance and exit wheels, which impede the movement of passengers through the fare array during normal um, ingress and egress as the train arrives and dis dis departs. Uh, at the northern end of that station, transit is considering four different, three different options. Uh, once they decide, that will be implemented. Um, and at the uh, southern end of the southbound platform, there is only one reconfiguration in that area. This improvement will improve access, daily access in and out of the station um, during normal operations and in emergency uh, situations. The elevator, the street architecture for the elevator kiosk is a standard New York City Transit elevator kiosk as approved by uh, PDC. This is the location on the northeast side of Exchange Place, and this is the elevator at the southwest side of Exchange Place. Sorry. Okay. So. Uh, what you see on the screen is the uh, the sections of the building, the 15 FAR compared to 18 FAR. It's important to note when we started the project as the architect, we were contemplating a, a very uh, a mixed-use building uh, and creating a, a live-work-play type of environment. We were looking at how we can use utilize all the FAR with um, within the ex the building envelope limitations of zoning, which there is no height limit in this particular district. So it's what's an important critical number to realize is. At, at a, a number of 220 feet above grade, 
is where our building uh, breaks over the Claremont Preparatory School. It's about 60 feet above that portion, which is required for legal light and air. So our residential always started at that height. Uh, below that height, we have mechanical floors, uh, residential amenity floors, and then we had our, our commercial office program. So we had four floors of commercial office, 32-foot floor-to-floor heights, and then our residential, again, above the 220 height, uh, with 12-foot floor-to-floors and um, uh, sp gaps for uh, structural air windbreaks and uh, mechanical spaces that go off such a, a tall tower to get us to our 1,100-foot tall, it's 1,115 feet tall uh, building. So when contemplating the bonus area and based on the timing of this approval process as well as the limitations of, and timing related to construction, uh, we wanted to make sure we designed and engineered a building that we could build as of right. Uh, but if we were to get the, the bonus, we wanted to understand how that would impact the, the building. So we, we just basically looked at how we can you know, add the 70,000 square feet. by. Uh, so we, we, our strategy was to basically double the amount of commercial, we were po uh, commercial office we were providing the building and then the remaining area would be uh, moved to the residential portion. And we basically reduced the floor to floor from a 12 foot floor to floor height to about a 10 foot, 10 floor to, hi floor to floor height. Um, and that would it gave us the ability to kind of keep the size of the building exactly the same and the locations of the structural windbreak openings in relatively the same locations. So it would be an easy transition uh, for the process. I think as you either are aware, the building is under construction right now, the foundations are underway. So this is our, it's our, our uh, building, um, which we think is going to be an elegant um, tower added to the downtown skyline. It's very much contextual, I think, with the, with the downtown aesthetic. Even the colors of the glass and metal are in uh, keeping a context to some of the warmer tones that you find downtown and the taller building. So um, what you see here is a view looking, um, looking north. So you see basically on this side, this is our southern wall which is our lot line wall with the adjacent 55 broad property. And the shaping of our tower is done in a way where all the residents would get you know, views not only uh, south and north uh, you know, around, around the, the building footprint. So here is a section of, the, uh, this is a blow up of the upper of the portion of the building looking south. So this is that northern facade that you know, has legal light and air uh, facing north on the upper levels. And you can see on the windbreak elements that are a part of the uh, structural design of the building, there's a, uh, this articulation that is, uh, I think, very reminiscent of some of the uh, taller buildings that were in the downtown area and are still in the downtown area. And then you'll see this is the view looking northeast and a, a kind of a blow up of the upper part of the building. So the articulations, again, go up the two win windbreak floors and kind of terminate the crown of the building where it meets the sky. And then that articulation is brought down and uh, present at the base of the building. It actually highlights the residential entry into the building, uh, which is in the center. We have a separate commercial entrance to the north that, uh, for the commercial tenants. And then we have a, um, a, s a separate service entrance that will be shared by both the residential and the commercial tenants uh, of the building. On the second floor, uh, you'll see some uh, this mechanical space. We are in a flood zone, so our major mechanical elements like electrical boilers and generators are, uh, you know, above grade and on the second floor. And our service, it's important to note that our client is going to, on trash service, that the trash will be brought out and be commercially picked up, both residential and commercial, to avoid staying on the street for any long periods of time. Questions? Before we close, I wanted to address uh, the two points raised by the council member uh, in her remarks. First, uh, with respect to jobs, good jobs, and second, with respect to uh, construction. Um, with respect to uh, jobs, the applicant takes seriously the need to provide good jobs and pay prevailing wage. Uh, there have been a series of discussions with 32BJ and its representatives. It's my understanding that an understanding is being inked today and will be provided to 32BJ and that it's been concluded. <laughs> with res uh, with respect to construction, similarly, we're very much aware that we are in a high-density, mixed-use <coughs> neighborhood with many residences. In fact, we are proposing to build a residential building um, and take that very seriously as well. We've been in discussion with your office and will continue to do so and will adopt a variety of measures to help address that. One of the ones that um, was discussed with your office, which we are in the process of implementing, is the creation of a website that will provide uh, neighbors with a look-ahead 
information about construction opportunities to directly access uh, the team to register concerns and complaints and so forth and so on. So that's among the things that we are doing and uh, other representatives of the team are available to provide more detail on that if you'd like. Thank you for your testimony. I just have one question before I turn it over to uh, Councilwoman Chin. Uh, the additional three FAR, how much bigger is this going to make the building in terms of height, in terms of stories? Okay, as, as we were explaining, the, the height of the building is 1,115. Did I get that right, Jim? Yes. Thank you. Um, and the, uh, that is an as of right uh, building, um, which has been uh, permitted by the Department of Buildings Excavation Foundation work is uh, in progress. If the bonus is granted, uh, rather than increase height, uh, the interior of the building will be, plans for the interior of the building will be, will be modified and the floor to ceiling heights will be reduced from roughly 12 feet to about 10 feet, 10 inches, and the floor area will be accommodated within the same envelope. And in that regard, I would just say that the um, approval as granted by the City Planning Commission uh, requires essentially that that height be maintained. We've committed to that height. We have no intention of increasing that height, and we will accommodate the floor area as described. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to now turn this over to uh, Councilwoman Chin for her questions. Thank you. It is a tall building, very tall. I hope it's not the tallest, right? No. no. It better not be taller than the World Trade Center no, building. It's not. Um, but it is, it stands out. Um, and I'm your neighbor. I'm not that far away. So you got to keep to your promise about being a good neighbor. And I think that one of the issue is these after hour variants, which mean doing construction after regular working hours in the evening and the weekend. And that is something that we want you to minimize as much as possible. As I said in my opening statement, we deserve a restful you know, sleep at night and not have to hear drilling at 10, 11 o'clock at night or even worse. Uh, because that's what's happening now in the neighborhood. Uh, and we're, we're hearing uh, complaints from constituents. Some of them might not be from your building because there are renovation going on right next to you. Mm -hmm. So I think that the after hour variance is a really key issue. And that is something that we are going to be really focusing on. So I hope that you take that into account and really minimize as much as possible. Um, that's one thing. And I'm really glad to hear that uh, the garbage situation, because like right now you walk down <laughs> Exchange Place, it's like a garbage dump on pickup, you know, the night before pickup. Uh, so it's good to hear that you will not be contributing to that. Right, so I won't see I won't see any garbage laying out in front of 45 Broad Street. No, it'll be minimal. We have all refrigerated storage in the building, and then it'll be brought out and coordinated with a commercial pickup schedule. So it should be sitting on the street a much shorter duration than we get now with when the city picks up things. But the, your residential garbage, are you going to be using the same? Yes, our, our client has committed to doing the same with the residential as they have to do with the commercial, and have commercial pickup of the residential garbage, <coughs> and that way for the city. That's great. That is something that we, we should mandate all the um, new building going forward because the you situation right now is really unbearable with yeah. all the garbage on I the think streets. A, a client felt very strongly that it was worth the extra cost to keep the, uh, the trash off the street as, and get it off as fast as possible. That's I good to hear. If I can just interrupt for a yes. second, because I am due at City Hall. Uh, I am happy to hand over this hearing uh, to the rightful chair, uh, my dear friend, uh, Francisco Moya. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you all uh, for your uh, being here this morning, and good luck on your development. And thank you, Councilwoman Chin. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Gradenchik. <laughs> I just wanted to also follow up with the, the question about the subway. Thank you, sir. Now, when you mentioned earlier about connecting to Wall Street, Hi. there's no elevator on Wall Street. So that really is not that helpful, right? Uh, but I think that from our discussion earlier uh, was that the, the owner are also going to maintain the elevator, so it's not going to be maintained by the MTA, but it's going to be maintained by the, the owner of 45 Broad? That is correct. There will be a, an agreement between the owner 
uh, and the transit authority with respect to ongoing maintenance at the expense of the owner. That, that's, um, I think that's very good. So this way, if, um, if the elevator uh, have problem, that's a direct number that we can call. Yeah, the, the protocols for, our, uh, for contacting the contractor or the owner haven't been developed yet, but we understand the importance of there being a real you know, on-time uh, instant ability to, to, to uh, identify problems. Uh, can you also go into a little bit more detail, because that, that was a really interesting point I remember when we met, about in the case one of the elevator is broken, that the other... Uh so, so the way the um, station functions, you come in on the um, southbound platform and all passengers are discharged. Um, the train pulls out of the station and pulls back into the northbound uh, platform where um, where um, um, where the passengers enter. So in the event that the elevator in the northbound, you know, the big thing is to not to get trapped in the station. So in the event that in the northbound elevator is down for some reason, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the event that the southbound platform elevator, which is the discharge elevator, is not working for some reason, a person, in a, in a disabled person can get onto the um, station, come back, and come back onto the um, northbound platform, discharge and get out that elevator. As opposed to currently when an elevator is not working at Fulton Street, um, you have to struggle to go back and figure a way to get home. Excuse me? South Fulton Street. Okay, so you, you know, you, yeah, you go all the way to Brooklyn. So this would avoid that extensive trip for them. So it's, it's a real plus. That, that's good. I think that's something that we wanted to uh, kind of emphasize. And I'm glad to hear about um, good paying job, prevailing wage um, with good benefits. So that's, that's, um, that is a model that we wanted to continue. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Chair Moyer. I, I'm finishing my questions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Barry Gradenchik, for uh, stepping in uh, while uh, I was uh, delayed. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you. So I'm going to call three names, and I just want to know if you're uh, actually testifying or just here to answer questions. Matthew Klein? Not testifying. You're not testifying? Erica? And I can't make out the last. Not testifying. Not testifying. OK. And Bob Gladstone? Not testifying. OK. We're going to move to the next panel, which is So we have Richard, um, Ellen, um, how do you say it? Ellenson. Ellenson. Edith uh, Prentice. Michael Schweinsberg. And Jesse Yates. Let's make a statement. Um, can you just state your name, please? Yeah, I'm uh, Richard Ellenson. I'm the CEO of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. And um, people with cerebral palsy are the 12th largest city in America. If you included all the families of people with cerebral palsy, we are the fifth largest city in America. If we consider, Edith? Sorry. No worries at all. <laughs> It's either here. Let me. Uh, you good? Okay. Yeah, fine. Thank you. If we consider all the people with disabilities in America, we are a larger city than New York City. If you consider the people who use wheelchairs, but the thing is, we don't hear enough about those folks. We don't see enough, and we don't know enough. And this is the reason, is because people with disabilities so often are forced to give up after you encounter so many stations that you can't get out of, so many curbs that you can't get down, so many restaurants that aren't available, people give up. They stop going out. And so what we really have is a crisis of spirit here. And we really need to change that. <coughs> Our foundation did a video called Zach Anner and the Quest for the Rainbow Bagel that some of you might have seen. 
It's about a guy in a wheelchair who leaves New York to get the Rainbow Bagel, which is a cool thing in Brooklyn, and it takes him seven hours to get there because there are no accessible subways. He ends up taking a ferry because it's closer to take the ferry than to take the subway. This is an issue that really, really needs to change. This amazing city that we have for people in wheelchairs, it's less than half the size as it is for everybody else. And we need to look at public-private partnerships to change this. Because what people in wheelchairs are hearing every morning when they get up is that the city doesn't care. Imagine if every morning you had to find ways to get to work. If you knew that if an elevator was broken and they didn't have a second one, you'd have to go all the way back. I'm also here as a father of a child with cerebral palsy. My son Tom is 20 years old now. We live on 88th and 1st, and we are the beneficiary of that fabulous new Q line, so he can get down but I work near Columbus Circle, and he can't get back up. This really needs to change. And what you have here is a group who is not only envisioning this amazing building that you can look up and you can be inspired by it, but they're looking at the ground. They're looking at the everyday life that is going on. They're looking at the real challenges, not just up there, but at pragmatics. And they're looking at how we can make this city better. So and we need to support We're keeping like that. everyone to two minutes, um, so if you can you yeah, wrap I it up. I'm exactly. So I just want, that's what that thing was. Yes. I thought it was an angel getting its wings. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just cannot say how much this matters to this community. And as you all go home tonight, take a look at curb cuts, take a look at subway elevators, take a look at the restaurants that you couldn't get into. And as you fall asleep last night, ask yourself, why doesn't this matter more to the city? And if everyone leaves this room, making it matter a little bit more to each of us and sharing that, there's no question that this should happen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mike Schweinsberg, and I'm the president of the 504 Democratic Club. Um, and Council Member Chin, many of the comments I wanted to offer, you so eloquently opened with, and I thank you for those. So. Um, I would just like to offer a couple of points um, that were touched on but not fully covered. The FAR bonus that they're seeking will not result in a taller building. That's the first time I'm seeing a picture of the building, by the way. It's pretty interesting. Um, the innovation lies in lowering the ceilings. Um, this, the, our involvement in this has begun a much broader conversation bringing folks together from government, real estate, and the advocacy world to brainstorm about potential modifications to existing zoning procedures that will allow new rules uh, to make subway accessibility bonuses available to developers throughout the city. Um, and the 504 Dems, I won't speak necessarily for DIA, but other um, advocacy organizations uh, representing the disability community, stand committed to uh, furthering this goal, and uh, we will keep our friends in the city council well informed, and hopefully you'll join those discussions. Because really this is uh, nothing less than a matter of our civil rights. We are the largest minority, and I ask you what other minority would accept being told, you can't enter here. You can only enter there. You can't exit here. You have to exit elsewhere. We know. Uh, I applaud our, the new president of uh, New York City Transit and his commitment to help us get there. But uh, this may be the ideal way to accomplish that goal through this private part, uh, public partnership. So I applaud the developer and ask for your help going forward. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Hi, my name is Edith Prentice. I am the former president of the 504, and I'm the current transit chair or whatever, <laughs> and I'm the president of DIA. <coughs> I stand very firmly supporting this station and these elevators whether or not I will ever use them. I believe every station should be accessible, our fantasy, 
along with tax fees, okay? Um, but I think that this partnership is probably the only way we're really going to get to 100%. You know, the MTA, it's promising. It's promising. We still have a number of the 100 key stations, which list was created in the early 1980s. Governor Mario Cuomo signed that settlement, which was a massive citywide lawsuit that encompassed almost every disability organization that went from the late 70s to the early 80s. And we're still waiting for many of those. Um, the S at Times Square was only supposed to be finished in 2008. So let's not hold our breaths. I think it's very important. There is nothing, there's no such thing as a bad elevator, all good. And I'm very happy with the plan about the roll around. I mean, how many times have all of us in the disability community gone around underneath City Hall? You know, you get to City Hall on the 6th, the elevator's out, you get back on the train, and it brings you around to the uptown side. One of the major problems we're faced with is the lack of information for how those sorts of changes can be made. And I certainly hope that this station starts a relationship with the MTA that will help us all travel easier and better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I basically just want to echo everything that everyone has said <laughs> thus could far. You could you um, just state your name? Oh, for the record? Uh, I'm Jesse Yates, and I'm actually a constituent. I live off of the J line in Bushwick. Um, so this is something that directly affects me every day. Um, I often take the Fulton station, or take the Fulton station to my apartment in Bushwick. And the amount of times that I've gotten stuck at that station because of lack of maintenance, there hasn't been an alternative to get out to Manhattan so you have to go back to Brooklyn when you're on the J line and that's deeply deeply shameful and the fact that we are leaning into the private sector to satisfy a civil right what is basically a civil rights law is deeply shameful but if you're willing to have those partnerships and if the partnerships are already created and they're already fulfilling the needs of the disabled residents, I don't, I don't understand why it's a point of contention, actually. I think that it just expedites the process. And I'm so, so excited to hear about that turnaround, about the ability to not be stuck in a station, because there's some, nothing more dehumanizing than having to call the fire department and wait two hours for them to carry you out and they never show up, so you ride back to Brooklyn because that's the that's what happens now. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Council? Okay. Thank you. Mohan Madabik. Good morning, members of the subcommittee. My name is Mohan Madabik and I'm here on behalf of my union, 32J, in support of the development at 45 Broad Street. My union ha our, union has, our union supports responsible developers that facilitate economic justice. Madison Equities has committed to create high quality permanent building service jobs that will su support working families as well as subway improvements that will make Manhattan more accessible to all. We urge you to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more members of the public that wish to testify? On this application. On this application. Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing uh, on this application. application.
Okay, we will uh, now move on to uh, block six, seven applications, uh, six, seven, five applications. These applications for uh, zoning map changes, tax amendments, and special permits will facilitate the transfer of floor area from Hudson River Park as permitted by state law to upland development sites. In 1998, the Hudson River Act, the Hudson River Park Act was adopted by the New York State Legislature, establishing the approximately 550 acres of Hudson River waterfront from Chambers Street to West 59th Street as the Hudson River Park. Hudson River Park has become one of the city's and state's premier open space resources, drawing approximately 17 million visitors each year. To continue the operation and development of the park, the act was amended in 2013 to stipulate that to the extent uh, practicable, the cost of operations and maintenance of the park be paid by revenues generated within the park. The state and city own the underlying park property and the Hudson River Park Trust leases the property from each entity and operates the park. In 2016, to facilitate the continued repair, rehabilitation, maintenance, and development of the Hudson River Park, the special Hudson River Park District was established. The provisions of the special uh, district permit permit the transfer of unused development rights from the park in exchange for financial contributions dedicated to the improvements of the park. The application before us today would establish a new granting site and new receiving site in the special Hudson River Park District, uh, permit a wider range of usage and uh, higher density on the two development sites, require permanently affordable housing, and support certain identified improvements and maintenance of Hudson River Park within Manhattan's Community District 4. The park and the development sites are in uh, Speaker Johnson's district. As a part of one of the applications, Site B, the Community Board, Administration, Development Team have been working with the Speaker to secure a permanent EMS facility on 29th Street. As I understand it, those discussions are still very much ongoing, but I understand how much of a priority this is for the Speaker and the community. So with that, I now open the public hearing on LUs 92 through 94 and on LUs 89 through 91 with our first presenter being the Hudson River Park Trust. And after that, we will hear from applicant DD West 29th LLC for site A, 601-613 West 29th Street, and applicant West 30th Street LLC from site B, 606 West 30th Street. Okay, and uh, Madeline Wills. <laughs> Good, mo good morning. I think it's still morning. Yes. Good morning. It's still morning. I'm Madeline Wills, and I'm president and CEO of Hudson River Park Trust. Hudson River Park is the second largest park in Manhattan and longest waterfront park at present in the United States. The park is celebrating its 20th anniversary in a few short weeks, and while the park has, been, uh, has spurred housing and economic de development for the city, we have struggled over the last 10 years to receive public funding to complete the park. Thankfully, in 2013, the state legislature amended the Hudson River Park Act and allowed the trust to sell some of the park's unused commercial development rights off of the park and to property under consideration for rezoning one block east of Route 9A. Since then, we were fortunate to have the City Planning Commission and the City Council approve the sale of air rights to 550 Washington Street, providing $100 million to repair the 15-point acre Pier 40 and save it from being closed to the public. And you'll be pleased to know that work on that critically important project has recently begun. <coughs> Today, on behalf of the Trust, I wish to thank you, Chair Moya, and also Speaker Johnson, who represents the subject area, and, um, and for considering these proposals that would enable the transfer additional floor area pursuant to the special Hudson River Park District. Should these actions be approved, the public will at long last be able to enjoy significantly more open space within the boundaries of Community Board 4 in Manhattan. There is more unfinished public park within this area than throughout the rest of the park. The trust proposes to transfer unused development rights from the granting site identified as portions of piers 59, 60, and 61 uh, to two locations, 
The first, 60129th Street, is known as the Douglaston Receiving Site, and the second, 606 30th Street, is known as the La Lazarian Receiving Site. Or in the alternate, 604 606 30th Street is known as the La Lazarian, La Lazarian Alternate Receiving Site. Prior to ULIP certification, the trust retained an independent appraiser who determined that the value of 123,437.5 square feet of development rights for transfer to the Douglaston site is $37 million. The appraised value of 29,625 square feet to transfer to the La Lazarian site was set at $9,570,000. And we expect that uh, 34,562.5 square feet of devel development rights to the La Lazarian alternate receiving site will be $11,164,812.50. The appraiser employed a standard methodology for evaluating transfer of development rights from one grantor to one seller, taking into account requirements for MIH and site-specific constraints and attributes. The trust has negotiated agreements binding on the developers of the receiving sites to pay these appraised values to purchase the development rights subject to ULERP approval and completion of the trust's significant action process. The trust has worked closely and collaboratively with Community Board 4, and in their recommendation, they listed eight projects to be completed in priority order. Given that the state has now approved funding of $50 million towards finishing Hudson River Park, should the air rights transaction now before the council be completed, six of the eight community board priorities will be funded. Beyond these six projects, Community Board 4 also listed Pier 97 and its adjacent upland area as their highest priority. I am happy to say that state funds approved in the 2018-19 budget will be used to construct this project. The other project, the area between 29th and 32nd Streets, cannot be built until there is a resolution on whether the proposed Gateway Tunnel project will be implemented, but the trust is prepared to start a design process for this area based on the community's requests. The specific projects listed by the community board, which will be covered by potential air rights transactions from these areas, um, well, here is Pier 97, what we're doing with state funds, and then the next project are, uh, will be upgrades to Chelsea Waterside Park, including construction of a comfort station, expanded dog run, and permanent open space picnic areas. Next is construction of a pedestrian platform uh, and new esplanade from Pier 98 to 99, which this isn't. Uh, there's also construction of a beach with ecological enhancements south of Pier 76, and that's on the northernmost uh, northern uh, 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 point of this picture. And then the design of the upland area between 29th and 34th Streets, uh, which is this area, with remaining proceeds, if any, dedicated to the construction of a portion of the upland park between 32nd and 34th Streets. In addition, the trust would reserve 20% of the total value of proceeds for future capital maintenance within Community Board 4. After conclusion of the trust's significant action process, an evaluation of public comments by the trust staff and the board, and subject further to the successful co conclusion of the ULIP process, the trust board will vote on the proposed agreements with Douglaston and La Lazarian for the development rights transfers. Thank you very much on behalf of the trust. Thank you. Just, questions? yeah, Sorry. <laughs> just two quick mm -hmm. questions. Uh, one, uh, how are the value of the air rights assessed? Um, it's uh, both based on, the air rights are assessed based on com comparables, uh, based on land value, and based on uh, one uh, site, uh, one particular site, that's the granting site, that can only be used uh, for air rights to the particular site that is the receiving site. And then um, they value uh, what is the uh, considerations on that particular site. Uh, the Gateway Tunnel will be coming close to that site, so that was one of the uh, issues that uh, probably brought the price down a little bit. 
uh, and an MIH also. So the valuation of Douglaston was a little bit less than Lalazarian because the valuation of Douglaston was based on the fact that Douglaston cannot build condomini condominiums. They have a 99-year lease with the, the, with the seller. And even though, and they are actually uh, our rentals. And then the La Lazarian site was based, uh, the appraisal was based on condos, even though they are also at this time uh, building rentals. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next panel is um, DD West. Um, Marcy Kessler, Jack Robbins, Stephen Charno. So just state your name. My name is Marcy Kessner. I'm an urban planner with the law firm of Kramer 11, which is Land Use Council to uh, DD West 29th uh, LLC. Uh, with me today are Stephen Charno, representing the applicant, and Jack Robbins of FX Collaborative, who is the architect of the project. Um, the pr project, let's see. Okay. All right. The the project to the proposed project today would be the second use of development rights transfer mechanism that Madeline Wills described previously, and this was created to provide critically needed funding for Hudson River Park. It would enable the development, the redevelopment of an underutilized 62,000 square foot site at 601 613 West 29th Street in Manhattan with 740,000 square feet of floor area, including 731,688 square feet of residential use containing both affordable and market rate housing, between 9,000 and 14,500 square feet of retail use at the ground floor, and up to 18,500 square feet for an EMS station. Permitted accessory parking will be provided. The project site will be mapped as an MIH area, and pursuant to option one of the MIH program, 25% of the residential floor area will be provided as permanently affordable housing. Uh, this shows the location in yellow of the Douglaston site and adjacent to it, the La Lazarian site, which will be presented after us. Um, the 62-story building at the site would be, was designed by the FX Collaborative, and Jack Robbins will speak after me, uh, describing the building's program and design. The project will provide $37 million to Hudson River Park Trust in exchange for the transfer of 123,437.5 square feet of unused floor area from Chelsea Piers, as you heard. HRPT, in consultation with Community Board 4, has determined that 80% of these funds will be used for specific park improvements, and 20% will be dedicated to future capital maintenance needs for park improvements within the Community Board. The proposed zoning actions before the uh, City Council are a zoning text amendment to create a map in the appendix to the special Hudson River Park Special District uh, regulations that would define Chelsea Pierce as the granting site and to uh, define the, um, the development site as a receiving site and to modify the floor area ratio parking and bulk regulations applicable in the C64X district when the City Planning Commission grants a special permit pursuant to this section. Uh, without the approval of a special permit, the zoning remains the existing manufacturing uh, floor area. Uh, the zoning map amendment would rezone the development site 
from an M23 district with a maximum FAR of two to a C64X district with a maximum floor area of 10, which may be increased to 12 FAR with the transfer of floor area by the special permit. Unless the special permit is utilized, there can be no increase in floor area. Uh, the special permit is the, f and then the, uh, um, map the uh, mapping the special Hudson, P Hudson River Park district over, this di over the site as well. The special permit would permit for the transfer of the floor area, height setback, tower lot coverage, and street wall location waivers. And then uh, as part of the amended application at the city, at the city planning commission, uh, the exemption of floor area for an EMS uh, ambulance station uh, on the site and uh, an increased maximum increase in the maximum number of parking spaces for EMS employees that will only be that floor area exemption will only obviously be used if the uh, EMS station uh, does locate in the site which is what we hope in the future there'll be a chairperson certification for the uh, issuance of building permits uh, on the pro on the pro closing of the development rights for the site. Um, this shows the location of the site within the zoning map in red. Um, it's an L-shaped site uh, on most, mostly on 29th Street and then going on to 11th, the whole 11th Avenue frontage and then wrapping around onto 30th Street. Uh, this shows the zoning map changed area to the C64X HRP district. Um, is that I guess uh, Stephen Charner will now talk about the uh, benefits of the project, um, both initially and through this process. <coughs> Good morning, Rod. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Chair Moya, committee members, thank you very much for, for uh, giving us the chance to speak today about our project. I'm just gonna speak briefly about, um, as Marcy said, uh, some of the benefits of um, our rezoning and also uh, some of the modifications and mitigations that we are have uh, added to the project um, as we've gone through the Euler process. Um, the rezoning will activate an underutilized lot. It really got left out of the rezoning of both Far West Chelsea and Hudson Yards. Um, so it's, it's an, it's, uh, will enliven the uh, pedestrian experience. Um, a lot of infrastructure, including the seven line, has now been built within a five minute walk of the site. Um, and the site currently is, is an underutilized um, 2.0 um, FAR. Uh, as as uh, Madeline Wills and Marcy also mentioned, we'll be providing um, $37 million of needed revenue to Hudson uh, River Park. Um, under the MIH program, we'll, um, we'll be creating um, approximately 247 units of permanently affordable housing. And in addition, um, significant contributions to the neighborhood. Uh, very early on in this rezoning process, which we've been at for uh, you know, more than four years at, at this point, um, the speaker, as well as uh, Community Board 4 came to us. There's an EMS facility, which is an open air facility located at 23rd Street. It's right under the High Line. It's not in an optimal location. Um, so we were asked um, early on to try to work with um, the city and the Community Board to, um, to accommodate um, that, uh, that use. And as Chairman Moya mentioned, uh, as, as, uh, as Chair Moya mentioned, that, that process is ongoing um, and we remain committed to working with the city to, to make that happen. Um, in addition, a portion of the site will be used initially to accommodate staging for the, um, for the gateway tunnel uh, project. Um, we estimate that we'll create more than 700 construction-related jobs, more than 50 permanent jobs. Um, as far as, if you go to the next page, um, we had a, um, a very good, um, robust exchange with our friends at Community Board 4, and uh, there are um, numerous modifications that were made as part of um, our back and forth with them, in addition to working with them on EMS. We've committed to um, equal finishes for, um, for affordable units, uh, discounted uh, building amenities for, um, uh, for affordable residents. In addition, there will be a free, um, while we will charge um, a fee, a monthly <coughs> fee for the amenities, there will be a free child play area which, which will be free to all residents and their children. Um, we've made a commitment that we will work towards um, having uh, neighborhood retail 
uh, and not have any big box retail. Um, some of the other things that we um, have been working with the community board, I won't read the whole list, but with their help, we figured out a program where we were in able to um, enlarge uh, the trash room um, and, and provide for refrigerated trash storage so that that will ensure that we can keep the trash in the building until the day that um, that trash is, is collected uh, curbside. Um, during Seeker, there were um, impacts that were identified and as our restrictive declaration for the project um, enumerates, you may have seen that already, um, our mitigations that we've committed to include $160,000 for um, an open space mitigation, which will be for improvements to Penn South Park Playground, um, approximately $85,000 to um, replace vegetation on the, um, on the High Line so that it's shade tolerant um, because we, um, we will be casting um, shadows during portions of the day on the High Line, um, a daycare commitment of up to $800,000, um, a commitment to exceed the energy code by 10%, um, and we will have an independent construction monitor to ensure that um, our dust and noise mitigation plans that will be um, prepared are followed. Um, finally, I mentioned two other things. I mentioned um, Hudson Tunnel staging, which we can get into more detail about that if, if anyone has any questions. Um, and finally, we have uh, made a commitment. Um, we have a neutrality agreement with 32B, uh, 32BJ, and so we have a commitment for um, union staffing for uh, building operations at the project. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, the project will uh, provide uh, affordable housing under the NIH program. Uh, the developer has uh, proposed uh, option one, which is 25% of the residential floor area in permanently affordable units with an average weight, weighted, uh, weighted average of uh, incomes of 60%. Um, the income bands are listed on the materials we've given you. 40% uh, um, at 40, 10 percent of the residential floor area will be provided to households earning 40% uh, of AMI, 10% uh, of the residential floor area, 60% of AMI, and 5% of the residential floor area will be uh, made will be uh, affordable to households earning 100% uh, per of AMI. This is studio, there's a mix of units, studio one and two bedrooms, and there are amen a range of amenities which, um, which Stephen has discussed, the children's play area, which would be uh, without any free fee, and uh, the other others will be uh, for fee and would be uh, provided a discount to affordable tenants. Here are the zoning uh, zoning text uh, zoning actions again. I don't <coughs> think I need to go through them the second time. And uh, now I hand it over to uh, Jack Robbins. Hi, Jack Robbins, uh, principal FX Collaborative. Um, this is a, a kind of close up of the site. Um, you can see it's 525 feet along 29th Street, um, full block uh, between 29th and 30th along 11th Avenue, uh, and then 100 feet along 30th Street. Um, the immediate context to the south is a, a block that um, Con Ed uh, owns and uses. Uh, across the street is the is the Ohm, another um, Douglaston uh, project. <coughs> um, and then across 30th Street, we have the the High Line you can see here, and then um, Hudson Yards uh, um, development beyond that. Um, just to uh, quick uh, kind of summary of some of the, the basic design moves for the building. Um, there were a number of things that kind of forced the massing uh, towards the east. Uh, um, the first you can see here is the floodplain. So there is a, a portion of the site that was I is in the <coughs> 100 year floodplain. Um, so we have adjusted the massing so that the entrance to the building and the majority of the, the uh, residential units are all out of that um, floodplain area um, on the higher portion of the site. Um, in addition, the, uh, um, the next is the um, gateway tunnel, so you can see a sort of alignment of the tunnel here. Um, what's shown here is both the proposed fan plant that they will build um, as part of that uh, and an area that they need for staging for the um, construction of the building. So both of those things, again, <coughs> encouraged us to move the, the bulk of the building towards 11th Avenue. Um, 
we in moving that uh, bulk there, we uh, kind of put the narrowest profile at the top of the building to sort of cast the least shadow on the high line um, and the areas to the north um, to really sort of optimize for the um, uh, solar exposure uh, <coughs> and also to put it closest to both the, the high line and the um, entrance to the number seven subway. Uh, the massing strategy really breaks the building down into three different parts, and those echo the context around it. The base of the building here in red really um, speaks to the, the lower buildings, um, the kind of traditional uh, warehouse uh, buildings that are um, in the West Chelsea neighborhood. The orange mid-rise piece here um, reflects the height of the buildings that are along the avenues and um, towers here uh, along 30th Street um, <coughs> that really came about from the uh, West Chelsea rezoning. Uh, and then the tallest um, portion here uh, really um, creates a transition between uh, Hudson Yards and uh, West Chelsea, um, trying to sort of um, mediate those heights, and you can see here some of the uh, heights that are uh, directly across the street, um, uh, considerably taller um, in Hudson Yards. Um, the expression of the building um, follows the same three-part uh, diagram in terms of the, uh, the facade uh, articulation, kind of more masonry and more massive uh, feeling as you at the base of the building, echoing those Chelsea warehouse uh, typology. Um, getting kind of uh, uh, glassier as you go up, so this is more reflective of the recent residential developments uh, in the area, and then the tallest portion the, uh, reflecting the, the um, development to the north in Hudson Yards. Uh, ground floor plan here, um, so I'm going to start here at the corner of uh, 30th and 11th Avenue. The um, stair coming down from the High Line is right across the street here. This will be a retail um, area. This is about 9,000 square feet at grade with a uh, potential for another five um, below grade here. Um, coming around 11th Avenue, the, the lobby and the, the entrance is on the corner here, really tries to activate that corner with the, um, the doors uh, on the uh, facing 11th Avenue here. Uh, core and back of house in gray you see here. Uh, and then the uh, remainder of the building along 29th Street is, um, is parking, uh, some uh, bike parking, and the proposed uh, EMS facility. That is the area at the, the far west portion of the, the site that's um, set aside for EMS. Um, there are, are two alternates that were included um, in case the uh, EMS um, uh, did not happen, um, and that includes um, expanding the parking. This would not increase the number of parking spaces, just the area for the parking, um, and the potential of, of uh, extending some retail along 29th Street as well. Uh, this is a, um, a largely illegible diagram showing <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the bulk waivers. I'm going to go to this one. Um, it's a little easier to understand. Um, the, there are really four uh, different bulk waivers. Um, the first uh, in pink here uh, for the uh, upper portion of the building um, just allows uh, for a depth that works for residential buildings and for some architectural articulation uh, along that facade. Um, <coughs> the second here in this orange um, allows us to put on 30th Street an outdoor terrace um, directly across from the High Line. It's basically at the same height as the High Line, so we very much like that kind of visual exchange between people activating the terrace and the people who are on the High Line uh, across the street from one another. Um, <coughs> the third uh, here at the um, entrance to the building uh, just allows for a setback there, a little bit more generous sidewalk space uh, around the, the entrance to the building. Uh, and lastly is the, um, is the total coverage for the, the tower uh, portion, which is just very slightly different than, than what is uh, required. Um, and this is a, a rendering showing that entrance area. You can see the <coughs> recessed entrance here, the sort of um, more massive masonry base, and then the sort of glassier elements as it sort of goes up the building and makes that transition 
to the what's across the Hudson Yards. questions I'm happy to answer them great well uh, thank you very much uh, I just want to say that I'm very uh, glad to hear that there's been uh, an agreement that's been met um, with uh, 32 BJ uh, I'm also been very encouraged to see that uh, the units uh, that are or the affordable units are going to have the same um, finishes as the um, luxury ones as well uh, I think that's always a good thing um, when we see that uh, commitment that's being made. Um, and I also want to say that um, the amenities that are being offered, um, you've come uh, to a good place there as well. Um, so I'm very encouraged by uh, the movement that we've seen uh, in the last 24 hours. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. David Karnofsky. If you can please state your names and then uh, you can begin. Uh, David Karnofsky uh, from Fried Frank, Land Use Council to the applicant 606 West 30th Street. And Justin Sherman uh, representing Ismail Leva Architects. Thank you for having us uh, today, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is an application by 606 West 30th Street, an affiliate of Lalazarian Properties for the development of a mixed use building uh, at 606, 604 West 30th Street um, through rezoning, a zoning text amendment, and a special permit for the transfer of floor area from Hudson River Park. Um, this project would be developed concurrently with the Douglaston development that you just, just heard about. Uh, I just want to clarify that uh, the initial application as certified by the Department of City Planning was for development that included uh, one lot, lot 39, Subsequently, we had the opportunity to enter into agreements to acquire the adjacent lot 38, which is a 25-footer uh, that intervenes between the original site and the Douglaston site, so that the application today is for a larger development of both lots 38 and 39, which results in an increase of floria, an increase of affordable units, and an increase in the amount of transfer from Hudson River Park and an increase in the payment to Hudson River Park. Uh, the site is shown here, uh, adjacent to the uh, Douglaston development along West 30th Street. Uh, this shows the existing conditions. The existing condition is a, uh, an auto repair and maintenance facility currently occupied under license by the Department of Sanitation for a small number of vehicles and a small amount of equipment. Uh, it's planned to be vacated by the Sanitation Department in July. The development is for a 12 FAR mixed use building uh, with residential floor area of about 193,000, commercial at about 14,000. It is a 41 story building with a height of 520 feet, 252 residential units with approximately 63 affordable units provided under MIH option one and with a 54 space parking garage, accessory parking garage. Uh, this slide shows the building in the context of surrounding existing and planned development and illustrates how it is, uh, reflects a transition between the taller buildings uh, to the north on the western rail yard and to the uh, northeast in the eastern rail yard um, and an appropriate relationship to the Douglaston development which is a taller building on the avenue. I'm not going to go through the actions in detail because they are essentially the same 
as for the Douglaston development with the exception that our special permit is for the transfer of a smaller amount of floor area by virtue of the smaller uh, size of our site. Uh, it's for the transfer of 34,000 uh, and 562 square feet of floor area from Chelsea Piers, uh, which will result in a payment uh, to the Hudson River Park Trust of approximately $11 million. Our bulk waivers are slightly different as well, of course, and we'll detail those in a minute. Um, in terms of the benefits of the project, before I turn it over to Justin, uh, obviously uh, this is an area that's underutilized and uh, presents an unattractive streetscape and it will be enlivened by a building that has ground floor retail, um, restaurants above, and residential, of course. Um, there will be a transfer from the Hudson River Park with a payment to them for purposes of open space amenities. From the point of view of affordable housing, as I mentioned, it's 63 units under option one. <coughs> um, the um, applicant has committed to provide identical finishes for the affordable units and the market rate units, uh, has also committed that um, uh, building amenities for which fees are charged will have a discount to the affordable unit owners, uh, residents of 33%. And with respect to unit distribution, uh, has agreed to uh, exceed slightly the 65% um, unit distribution requirement under MIH. Other commitments include um, addressing street trees uh, in the event that um, street trees cannot be planted due to Con Ed infrastructure to seek revocable consents to install the trees in planters. Um, we do not have a um, loading dock. Uh, the size of the, of the uh, development does not warrant it. So we've committed to uh, making efforts to use the garage entry for deliveries to avoid uh, congestion on the street. Uh, we've committed to car sharing in the garage to electric car charging. Um, with respect to maintenance workers, um, we have exchanged uh, agreements uh, with the uh, 32BJ and we expect to conclude that t today, if not uh, tomorrow. Um, and with respect to uh, the mitigations um, that Douglaston described, we would provide our share of those mitigations with respect to childcare, with respect to open space, and with respect to shadows. So I'm now going to turn it to Justin to describe the building in some more detail. Very good. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Justin Sherman. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a senior project manager at Ismail Leva Architects. I'll be speaking about the architectural aspects of the building, uh, which is located uh, on the western portion of Block 675. Uh, as you can see, uh, the design takes place, uh, it gathers inspiration from the hi existing High Line and its industrial heritage. Uh, the configuration of the podium is a contemporary interpretation of the shipping container, uh, which is intimately associated to the history of the High Line. Uh, the, the base will also use the color and materiality of cast iron in the details on the ground floor storefront and the podium floors. Uh, the project will have primarily commercial uses on the podium floor uh, and residential uses from floors four and up. The project aims to activate the street and the frontage facing the High Line at the lower levels by proposing <coughs> uh, commercial use at the first floor, second and third, uh, along with the residential lobby and parking entrance at grade. So this is the second floor plan with the split parking commercial at street frontage and commercial at grade as well, and then a third floor commercial portion. Uh, <coughs> the primary commercial use of the second and third floors will be a restaurant with outdoor terrace space at the third floor facing the High Line to further activate the street frontage. The second floor also helps to screen the parking use behind the commercial space. Uh, floors 4 to six, uh, 36 will have residential units with the exception of the 21st floor which will house the residential amenities and mechanical uses on a portion of the 20th and 22nd floors. <coughs> the midsection of the building also has an interior green wall or vertical garden feature which is a reflection of the greenery of the High Line uh, expressed on a vertical plane and extends from the terrace level at the amenity floor to the top of the 26th floor. Uh, the feature can be enjoyed by the residents of the building and, as well as the visitors on the High Line. This feature will be lit up at night. 
And here are illustrative uh, building sections, both cut at uh, through the street and High Line. Uh, the building section on the right highlights the recess where the uh, green wall feature would take place. And I'll go back to David to discuss the bulk waivers. Thank you. Uh, the bulk waivers are designed to facilitate the building that Justin's just described. And very briefly, uh, there's a waiver of the uh, base height, the minimum base height under the C64X is 60 feet. We propose a base height of 45 feet. That facilitates this relationship of the um, restaurant uses to the High Line and uh, provides a kind of visual connection uh, to the High Line. Um, the um, rear yard waiver facilitates the inclusion of the parking uh, and the commercial use on the second floor, and the other waivers uh, allow for balconies that would provide a open space amenity for residents. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. Um, as as you were <coughs> mapping the uh, MIH option one. Yeah. Um, what is the breakdown of the affordable affordability levels for the units, and uh, how are they going to be spread out uh, throughout the building? Okay, so um, as you know, uh, option one provides for 25 percent of the foyer to be affordable, 10 uh, percent uh, at 40 AMI, 10 uh, percent at 60, and 5 percent at 100 is what we uh, envision. Uh, in terms of the uh, unit mix, um, we envision 25% uh, studios, 50% uh, one bedroom, and 25% a two bedroom. Obviously, that will mirror the, uh, the market rate distribution. In terms of distribution on floors, uh, as I mentioned, MIH regulations require a distribution of the affordable units on 65%. Um, we expect to be able to exceed that, um, currently estimated at 67, 68%. And um, the amenities and the finishes, are they going to be the same? Yes. As I indicated, the finishes will be the same. Okay. Um, and with respect to the amenities, to the extent that an amenity has any charge, the affordable unit residents will have a 33% discount. Okay. And uh, I'm very encouraged to hear that there's been conversations with uh, 32BJ. Um, obviously, uh, good paying jobs uh, to run those buildings are, are very important to us. Um, so I, I, I hope to see that get done within the next uh, 24 hours, as you said. We expect to, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the next panel is we're going to do three um, in favor. Uh, Aleta Lafarge, Adrian Ford, Panos Kutris, yeah. and can you please state your names? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Alita Lafarge. I'm here representing Manhattan Plaza Tenants Association. Uh, I'm, my name's Adrian Ford, and I'm also representing the Manhattan Plaza Tenants Association, and I think also just representing a member of Community Board 4 and uh, a longtime resident in uh, Hell's Kitchen. Panos Kutris, 32 BJ. Um, as neighbors who use the park with our families, we do support the sale. Um, of the transfer rights from Hudson River to the developers in order to fund greater improvements to the park. If there is an opportunity for more funds, that just means more can be done. The state funds are good, but more funds coming from developers. Building in our neighborhood would, of course, be better. And we also would just like to mention we are fully in support of union labor, 100%. Um, so. I've been living in uh, Hell's Kitchen for 36 years. I also walk, work there um, on 57th Street and uh, 11th Avenue. And um, I personally use the parks. I've seen, I've seen them go from not having much development at all and playing on Pier 84 when you could just fish off the side. It, the, it was practically crumbling under my feet to seeing the incredible development that's taken place over a number of years. 
and I fully support the devel- the sale of the development rights because I think um, all this funding that can come to the Hudson River Parks Trust to complete the projects that they've already started and bring a sense of like co- cohesiveness to it, to the parks is going to be tremendous for me as somebody who likes to jog da- up and down the river to my children as uh, I've had birthday parties in our parks and picnics with them and we ride down the bike lanes to bring them to Little League and um, I just think the value that it will bring to our community is, as you can see, I'm wearing, <laughs> I'm, I dress brightly to remind everybody of how little green we see in the city and being in one of the most congested um, districts in the city, I think it's the most, in fact, in terms of traffic congestion, is you really need a breath of fresh air and uh, you cannot put a value on, uh, on what these parks bring to our community. So if, if the sale of these development rights to developers who, are, who seem to have some thoughtful um, developments, I think affordable housing is also a great perk for our neighborhood, especially for families as a, uh, families are constantly priced out of the city, but the, the parks, is, uh, that value is uh, priceless. And uh, as, as Alita said, state funding is, is great, but any, anything more that can be done, I think uh, uh, we should accept with open arms. And I, I also support union labor. I don't wanna see that rat around <laughs> my neighborhood. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, would I just, cannot say enough how important this would be for my family specifically, but also for our neighborhood, which we really work hard to uh, represent. Yeah. Good morning, and thank you to the speaker, to the chair, and the, and the subcommittee. My name is Panos Kutris, and I'm a building service worker, as well as a member of 32BJ. I'm here to tell you how important it is to have a commitment to good job at La Lazarian's Development 606 West 30th Street. The jobs at the building will affect the well-being of the community for years to come. Development that pay building service workers brilliant wage and benefits allow us to stay in New York and support our families. La Lazarian has reached out to 32BJ about ensuring good jobs at this site. We look forward to working with them to guarantee family sustaining jobs uh, at their project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have the next panel. Um, we have Joe Rastucha, Lowell Keen, Lee Compton, Paul Delv- Del- Devlin. Devlin and Betty McIntosh. Thank you for being here. Just uh, please state your names for the record before you uh, testify. Thank you. My name is Lee Compton. I'm representing Community Board 4. Betty McIntosh, Community Board 4. Paul Devlin, Community Board 4. Lowell Kern, Community Board 4. Joe Rastuccia, Community Board 4. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Lee Compton. I am co-chair of Community Board 4's Chelsea Land Use Committee. My colleagues and I are here to comment on applications for two proposed developments on Block 675, the northwest corner of Chelsea adjacent to the Hudson Rail Yards. We greatly appreciate the willingness of the applicants to engage with us during this lengthy process. Block 675 was scheduled to be a full block park over a sanitation facility, buffering the lower scale of Chelsea from the massive development on the rail yards to the north. Once we lost the park, we attempted to have Block 675 included in the Special West Chelsea District where text provisions respect the area's history and context, but unfortunately, we lost that battle as well. Developers now see an opportunity for the immense buildings on the rail yards to infiltrate Chelsea. 
Our preference has been for a 450-foot height limit on Block 6, 675, providing a transition between the lower scale of Chelsea and the buildings on the rail yards. We now support a 20% increase in building heights to accommodate the Hudson River Park transfer rights. We ask that the maximum building height be set at 550 feet for the Douglaston project and at 500 feet for the La Lazarian project. We also ask that the lots comprising the two projects be included in the Special West Chelsea District. We are disappointed that the affordable units to be generated by the projects will be segregated in the lower floors. We believe that economic integration can be a vehicle to achieve social and racial integration. We ask that you mandate a broader distribution of affordable units than the applicants have proposed. Finally, we're propo we are pleased that EMS Station Number 7 seems to be on its way to finding a permanent home on Block 675 with the space and amenities it needs. <coughs> we ask, however, that you require the city to acquire the proposed site now so that there will be no unfortunate snags when the interim gateway project use of the site ends. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair. I'm Betty McIntosh, co-chair of the Manhattan Community Board for Land Use Committee, and I'm also speaking on the Douglaston and La Lazarian proposals. Lee mentioned about affordable housing. I want to reemphasize that. Community Board 4 has a longstanding policy for mixed income buildings to ensure equity between affordable and market rate apartments. We uh, are pleased that all the finishes and appliances will be the same in both types of units in the projects. However, we strongly urge the City Council to require that affordable units be distributed throughout at least 80% of the floors in both projects. Douglaston has not committed to apartment distribution for affordable units uh, beyond the MIH requirement of 65%. You just heard La Lazarian, 67%. Our position is based on the firm belief in the great importance of a mix of people with varying incomes and ethnic and racial backgrounds. We abhor segregation of various groups of people from one another. Community Board 4 is concerned about the administration of the payment for the child care mitigation. City planning report specifies <coughs> that applicants are to pay a lump sum payment based on a formula which would be paid to a fund designated by ACS. It is not clear that the payment would be used only in Community District 4. We ask that the City Council require that the funds are only in our district and clarify how the payment will be administered. Uh, we also have concerns about um, the trash dumpsters inside the buildings and are very cheered up that that's being dealt with um, forthwith with uh, both projects. I think I'm the first that can say good afternoon. And thank you for your time. <laughs> I'm Paul Devlin, a member of the Chelsea Land Use Committee of Community Board 4. And thank you for your time. The Community Board 4 has recommended denial of this application unless our conditions described in communications are met. To begin, I want to thank the developers for their willing and active engagement with our board to attempt to resolve numerous issues. The current application reflects several changes made by the applicants in response to our concerns, and we all think it's a much better development as a result of this hard work. Combined, these two developers will be bringing over 1,200 apartments into our neighborhood. We as neighbors wish to ensure that the new residents are integrated into our community and that these new people receive community benefits, but that the additional burdens to make this a desirable place to live aren't placed on the residents who live in the neighborhood today. You have a rare opportunity today to tackle an issue that has come before us in the past and is certain to come to us again in the future. The critical issue is the amount of money the community will receive for the transfer of the development rights from Hudson River Park. The price of transfer rights is critically important for those of us in West Chelsea because it offsets the rapid and tremendous growth with the protection of our community, our neighborhood, and our special resources. The transfer of development rights from Hudson River Park Trust to Douglaston and La Lazarian is a very large number and that will do a lot of great things along the river. But please, don't be misled by the total number in and of itself, but instead look at how it was calculated. I think we're getting shortchanged and we should be receiving more for these rights based on looking at square foot costs in our neighborhood. There are a number of examples you can use 
where development rights have been transferred. In private transactions between landlords and developers, we're seeing prices in the ranges of $800 to $1,000 per square foot. Recently, the City Planning Commission recommended setting the price for transfer rights of West Chelsea at $625 to provide resources for the housing fund. The trust itself sold development rights to St. John's Terminal and West Village for $500. Yet, in this case, Hudson River Park Trust and the two development teams arrived at a price that is surprisingly below what would be expected at only $300 per square foot. We urge you to review the methods used to come to this price. We strongly believe that their assumption and the appraisal are flawed and that the base ratio should be an 87% thre threshold and that the best use of these should be determined as condos. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lowell Kern. I am the co-chair of the Waterfront Parks and Environment Committee of Community Board 4. And I want to piggyback on what Mr. Devlin was saying. The money issue is not just about money. As Ms. Wills sat here and told you this morning, there are a number of projects in Community District 4 that need to be completed for the park to be completed. We have the least amount of completed park space in Hudson River Park, and we need the money to finish the park. As Ms. Wills went through, there are a number of projects that this money can fund, but there are also a number of projects that we just don't have the money for. There is the Chelsea Waterside Park. There's the bridge at Pier 66. There are three different projects between 28th Street and 36th Street. We want to redo the area in front of the Circle Line and make that more park friendly instead of just a bunch of driveways. We've got three different projects relating to Pier 97 that we just don't have the money to finish. We need the money to finish the park because we don't have enough park space in Community District 4. Other thing I want to address, there are two mitigations in here that directly relate to parks. The first is there's 250,000 that is not designated as of right now. We have met with um, the City Department of Parks and Recreation they need that money desperately to finish the basketball courts, to redo the basketball courts at Chelsea Park, just blocks from this site. So we would like the 250000 to go to the basketball courts at Chelsea Park. There is also an $85,000 mitigation for loss of sunlight on the High Line. I love the people of Friends of the High Line. They don't need the money as much as the City Department of Parks and Recreation does, and there are better uses for that $85,000 as far as our committee is concerned that can go toward either Hudson River Park or other parks in Chelsea that desperately need this money. Thank you. My name is Joe Restucci. I'm the co-chair of Housing, Health, and Human Services Committee of Community Board 4. I want to piggyback again on the issue of this integration. The developers have committed to 65 or 67 percent integration. The truth is they can do better. Their projects economically allow them to do better. They have a philosophical difference with us. We need to push them to get to a higher number because the truth is in these buildings people don't care where you live. It's all about people mixing together and that to us is a big issue. It's economic, racial, and ethnic integration. The uh, question of the height has to come down somewhat. We don't believe we're going to get a great reduction here, but it really is not a transition zone to West Chelsea. It's in West Chelsea, and this has been an ongoing problem for us. Lastly, EMS. EMS service for the west side of Manhattan from Fifth Avenue to the Hudson River from West 12th to West 62nd Street is being handled from two open air trailers under the High Line on West 23rd Street. This is an absolute disaster. It provides horrible service and it provides horrible ability for the p workers who are there to actually function. We, are, we have worked with FDNY, EMS, DCAS, the administration, the Port Authority, New Jersey Transit, and Amtrak to come up with a solution here for both a permanent location on West 29th and a temporary location in the West 40s, west of 11th Avenue, courtesy of the Port Authority. We want to say thank you very much and we need to move this to conclusion. It's been a long haul and we're very close. Thank you. Th thank you. <laughs> the developer has absolutely enjoyed the strip every step of the way. <laughs> well, thank you. And just uh, let me say that, um, you know, the, the dedication of community board members is something that I always look at. Um, this is a volunteer position, and um, you do great work.
to represent your community and uh, everything that you've said here uh, will be taken into consideration. So thank you very much for your time and your efforts uh, in really coming up with a very thoughtful uh, process to all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just some music. Just one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next panel is Anthony um, Borelli. Uh, Connie Fishman, uh, Adrian Ford, Catherine Sally, and Rita, oh, I'm going to butcher this one, uh, Jer, Jer, how is it, how do you say it, Jakubowski, I don't see Anthony Borelli, so I'm just going to yeah, start. Just state your name and. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you for holding this hearing, Chair Moya and committee members. My name is Connie Fishman, and I am the executive director of Hudson River Park <coughs> Friends. Friends is a nonprofit fundraising and advocacy organization that supports the operations and public programs of Hudson River Park. I'm here to support the sale of the air rights from Hudson River Park's Community District 4 Chelsea Piers to Block 675. In addition to being Friends Executive Director for the past year and a half, I was also the President and Executive Vice President of the Hudson River Park Trust for approximately 12 years. Consequently, I look forward more than anybody to the day when Hudson River Park is finished. Community District 4 residents in particular have been waiting for many years to see the remainder of their waterfront north of 29th Street developed into a new green park for relaxation, sports, recreation, and enjoyment by millions of New Yorkers. I want to thank all of the parties involved in this process for working together to identify the park priorities for this community, and I look forward to the planning and design process for the portions of the park that will be built with these resources. The money generated for the park through these transactions will go a long way towards finally completing the northern section of Hudson River Park. It has be been nearly 20 years since June of 1998 when the Hudson River Park Act was passed by the New York State Legislature, and it is high time that the park was fully built and serving its many neighbors from Battery Park City all the way up to 59th Street. And I thank the council members in advance in their role in helping ensure this vision. Thank you. I'm Rita Jakubowski. I'm a, a much newer member of the um, of the community uh, on on 43rd Street. I'm a member of the 44th Street Block Association and the Hudson River Parks Trust, and a uh, sort of de facto head of the um, of the Pier 84 Garden, uh, which is lovingly cared for by a group of uh, 12 to 15 other volunteers. Uh, we have created a venue at Pier 84 that attracts uh, tourists, locals, uh, children, um, birds, bees, and, and, a and a lot of other creatures. I am, I am in favor of the, um, of the development uh, in question here, and I also would be an advocate for greater uh, consideration of adding more gardens to the um, to the park as it is uh, developed, and I hope that some of the resources that would be a, that would become available as a result of selling the air rights will uh, go toward development of more gardens on the on the river. Thank you. Isaac Halperin. David Jur Juras Juras Jurassic, Sus Susanna Aaron, Aletta Lafargue, and Tom from Plumback. Tom? Thank you, Council Member Moya, for holding this hearing today. 
I'm the general manager of Downtown United Soccer Club, a nonprofit organization that facilitates uh, thousands of children uh, and youth uh, for both recreation and competitive soccer. Uh, we are players, our community rep represent our constituents. We're all frequent park users. And we are all dependent on Hudson River Park and Pier 40. We look forward to the day that the park is completed, especially more fields, open green space, and beautiful piers in community board number four, north of 29th Street. We thank the community, community board, and Hudson River Park friends, and the trust for working together to identify projects that would be funded by air rights that are also the community's priorities. This chance to sell some of the park's unused development rights to the properties at Block 675 seems important, and we support the nearly 50 million that would go towards completing the park. The park can take a huge leap forward in terms of this completion with this money. We support the Block 675 proposal and the transfer air rights for much needed funding for the water par uh, waterfront park and fields. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any uh, other members of the public who wish to testify on these matters? Seeing none, uh, I will now close the public hearing on these applications. Uh, and they will. All items on today's calendar will be laid over. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the public and my colleagues, and of course, the council and the land use staff um, for attending today's hearing. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.